production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. This time on Broad and High, get a preview of what's in store at this year's Columbus International Film and Video Festival. I really see this as a celebration of film in Columbus. Meet a Cleveland papermaker who's putting a unique twist on a traditional Korean wedding gift. And peek inside the world of competitive yo-yoing. This and more right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome to Broad and High. The 65th annual Columbus International Film and Video Festival is this week. You might not know this, but it's actually the oldest film festival in the United States, dating back to 1952. Here's more. How many jobs? Three. This is the last one. The last one. This one's different. The, the Columbus International Film and Video Festival is part of the Columbus College of Art and Design. I am not the one who wants to give our money away, remember? It's him! Oh, yeah? It's him! Yeah. Uh, it is the longest running film festival in the entire country. Uh, the second longest running in the entire world. Well, this year it goes from April 19th through April 23rd. Uh, we are showing films here at CCAD. We are showing films at the Wexner Center and we are showing films at the Drexel Theater. I talked to Amanda earlier today. She said her dad got laid off. If anything happens, believe me, you're not gonna hear it from Amanda. I don't know how to say this to you, but Barnhart Tool and I will be closing its doors. I'm so sorry. I believe that there are 78 total films showing. 28 of those films are actually either from an Ohio filmmaker who has kind of moved on, uh, lives out in California or Chicago or what have you, but still has an affinity for the city and is coming back, or they were shot directly in Columbus. So it's uh, over a third of what we're showing is actually from here. It's not supposed to be like this. Nothing is supposed to be like this. I like to put the violins outside like this in the sun. This is the way the old masters did it. Strahd Style is the story of a man who lives in Laurelville, Ohio, who through kind of a social media exchange, decided he was going to try and build a Stradivarius violin. Yeah, well, I'm gonna do it. Now, how much would you charge? I was looking online and the, the sex dolls that people make are over $7,000, some of them. It is a documentary of his attempt to do this. It is very funny, and he, the lead subject, will be at the film festival with this violin, so you'll get to see uh, how it works out. I'm not even a trained violin maker. How am I gonna do this? Goodness, he's a character, definitely. He's such a sweet boy with a, with a great outlook on life. My full name is Jarrell Tatis Michael House. The JJ Project was actually shot up in Mount Vernon. The lead is from Mount Vernon. And uh, it is about a boy with fragile bone syndrome who goes on to direct musicals in Mount Vernon and really kind of inspires the community. Now, are you doing this because you want a director or you want to boss people? <laughs> a little bit of both. In the past two years, the amount of filmmaking that we've seen come out specifically of Columbus, Ohio, has nearly quadrupled. And so I'm really proud that we're able to bring so many Ohio films here. All right, get it back. You just asked me that? Yes, I'm asking you. Why did you make me wear this? Because you look like a truck driver who'd been living in a Mexican motel for a year. That's why. I really see this as a celebration of film in Columbus.
The 65th Columbus International Film and Video Festival lasts through Sunday, April 23rd, with films screening at CCAD and the Drexel Theater. You can find details and showtimes on the festival's Facebook page or by visiting columbusfilmfestival.org. Korean wedding ducks have long been a symbol of marital fidelity and fertility, and they're traditionally carved out of wood. This next segment showcases a Cleveland artist who deconstructs it even further by creating ducks out of woven paper and dyes that are all sustainably sourced in Northeast Ohio. In Korea, there's a tradition when people get married that one of the very common gifts they get is um, they get pairs of wooden ducks, wedding ducks, and they're carved and then they're painted these beautiful colors to signify mandarin ducks, which are a species that are known to mate for life. I always grew up seeing them. You know, every kind of household, every married couple has them. The Korean tradition of offering newlyweds wooden ducks dates back 2,000 years to a time when male suitors offered families live ducks in exchange for someone's hand in marriage. As a way of paying homage to this custom, Amy produced a series of mandarin ducks using another ancient Korean practice, papermaking. Papermaking in Korea is almost 2,000 years old. It has very long history, and it was maybe one of the second kind of big cultures that um, started to make paper in the world. And so it started in China and then went to Korea because they were very closely connected. And um, it came first as a vehicle for religion, for Buddhism, for a way for them to um, copy their sutras and, and then be able to disseminate this information. And then beyond that, they started to realize how strong this paper was and they realized they could turn it into so many other things. And you had paper chamber pots, you had paper furniture, you had hats, you had um, all kinds of things. The paper Amy uses to craft her ducks is derived from the mulberry tree. The plants are grown at the Morgan Art of Papermaking Conservatory on East 47th Street in Cleveland, where Amy teaches the ancient art of Korean papermaking. We've waited until all of the leaves have fallen and we're cutting all the way at the base of this plant and it will grow right back the next year. So this inner bark, the white bark, is what you want for papermaking. It's the only kind of public place where people just can come in from anywhere and learn how to make paper in the Korean tradition from scratch. Extracting the pulp used to make paper is a laborious process. It starts by steaming the branches so the bark can be removed. The inner stem is then boiled and the long fibers are removed. After cleaning, the fibrous material is beaten creating short strands of pulp that go into a watery solution known as a slurry. A large screen goes into the slurry many times and in many directions to evenly distribute the fibers and drain off the water. What's left behind is a thin layer of fibrous material that becomes paper. The, principally, the fibers are lining up, you know, crossing each other, hair-like, and, and with water they wind up and they become like that and as they come down they compress on themselves so it's amount of how much pressure what type of techniques what kind of fibers what gives you strength actually when you compress the fibers and you um, the density of, uh, of paper is actually higher than like a wood because you're actually compressing it and you know taking things and, and making them even denser and it's hard to get around that in the sense of how we relate to paper but if you were to make a a piece of furniture out of compressed, even if it was compressed cotton, it is as strong or stronger than, than that same density of wood. After the paper dries, Amy begins assembling the ducks by first cutting handmade paper into one-inch strips that are woven together into string. I use my hands to um, essentially twist and ply the paper. It's exactly like making rope. So this is the process known as chisung, and chisung is um, this very old craft form in Korea of taking these, 
these strips of paper and then twisting them. I have to do that for one end of the strips and then I have to turn it around and sit on the other end so I can finish the entire length of the strip and I have to do that then for hundreds and hundreds of pairs so that I get hundreds and hundreds of cords so that I can start weaving. Traditional basket making techniques are used to weave the string into a duck. The process is called twining, which is a basketry and a very old um, process that almost every culture in the world actually has developed. And so you have to take these paper cords, and I usually start with a knot that ends up giving me eight different cords come s shooting out of a center and just go round and round and round and round until it gets bigger. And, and to make it get bigger and stay flat, I have to then add more of these ropes, which I usually call spokes, because it is like spokes in a wheel. And then the pieces that go around, the threads that go around, are called weavers. I do think the hardest part of making the ducks is making a really smooth, continuous curve. You know, when I think about potters and the way that they shape things to make them round, or sculpture, sculptors, and they can kind of control that in a different way. I have to think about how to do that, but in a way where you're using building blocks. You know, how, how do you make Legos that are square look like they're making a curve? It's the same problem. I am inspired by what Amy does. I mean, I, and her dedication to the craft, probably 40 to 60 hours in a, in a duck. And to see the various twists and turns, the, the nature and the size of each, some of the colorations and things like that, they were all like, well, this is, you know, for me, and then I, knowing, you know, deep down, I know exactly what kind of effort and time went into each one of those, and I've seen her make them, so I, I know, you know, visually I can, you know, so that educates me before I even see it. So that was, you know, a treat to see him, and then to, to even see him in nests and oddball, like random things that she actually wove the nests just to place them in um, as kind of a presentation. It's just, uh, you know, it has a light side, a very light side to it. It has a traditional side to it. Using these traditional papermaking techniques and sustainable practices are essential to Amy for many reasons, but especially as a way of connecting to her Korean heritage and her love of history and humanity. It's important to me, I think, in the big picture, just as a human being on this planet that cares about um, preserving craft traditions that humans have figured out over hundreds of years. You know, it took a long time to figure out how to make such a fine and beautiful and useful product. Um, and also, to, it's important for me as a paper maker to round out paper making history. There, isn't, there hasn't been a lot of information about Korean paper, and there's been a lot more research done in other kinds of paper making. And so I just wanted to kind of fill a gap that, that I saw. You can see more of Amy's Korean paper artwork from her woven wedding ducks to dresses and knitted books at amylee.net. The Hmong people are an Asian ethnic group originally from the mountainous region of southern China. And this next story introduces us to a musical instrument that is uniquely identifiable with their culture. It's spelled Q-E-E-J, but it's pronounced Gleng. It's a reed instrument, and when played, it acts as an extension of the Hmong language because each note actually symbolizes a word. In fact, musicians who play this instrument are often thought of as storytellers. Check it out. Play the thing. Essentially, you're kind of just talking to the deceased uh, spirit. You're giving um, directions: take a left here, follow the chicken here. The thing was created to kind of uh, keep the dead dead. And it's important to my culture because it's unique, and all the culture really has instruments uh, similar to ours, and it makes us stand out for who we are. In the 
Hmong culture. It's part of the Hmong uh, funeral ceremonies. The thing is played throughout the night. The thing song that I'm playing today, it's a song that's more related towards the people that come visit the deceased. They usually bring an animal uh, offered to the deceased. The song talk about the relatives bringing a cow, how they offer the cow to the deceased, and how the cow doesn't want to go, but it has to go. At the funeral homes, when they're playing the entertainment songs called Nundus, about halfway they'll stop and then they'll sing the song. The audience or like the people attending to know what the song is about. The clothing that I have on is traditional monk clothes. As you can see, uh, the story class a uh, little bit, the bandao, as well as uh, coins. And what the coins represent back then was wealth. So the more coins you had on, the more wealth. Nowadays, it's more just to keep the tradition alive. When I was about like three, four years old, we watched this video and I saw a man performing. And I told my mom, like, Mom, I want, I want one of those. So then she uh, told my grandma. And then my grandma uh, ordered one from Thailand. And then like when I was about six or seven years old, that's when they enrolled me uh, at the program at the Hmong Cultural Center. When I'm teaching my students at the Hmong Cultural Center, first we sing the song and then we, I would blow and they would follow. Try it again. The hardest part about teaching the game to students is just memorizing because it's not written down on paper or anything. Okay, good. Now, Ju, why don't you continue from that part on? So you're gonna blow the second one. Usually they would get it. If they don't get it, I'll take out a piece of paper and then like draw the little uh, circles and dots on it. And I'll draw it out for them with the inhale and exhale too. And then they just learn from that to help them out on some more of the difficult parts. At the funeral homes, there's a stick that uh, you could think of as like a door from the real world to the spirit world. And we're going to practice uh, using it here just to um, show the student how it's done. What I like most about teaching is seeing the students be uh, um, excited when they're actually learning and like once they actually get it and they're actually blowing it, you, you, can set, you can tell that they're actually kind of like amazed that they actually know how to do and they're, they're able to continue learning the Hmong culture. Dragon Cat. Culture is, I believe, like your identity. If in the future the Hmong people don't know their own culture anymore, then I think that's kind of sad. <sighs> okay. Uh, David, you could, you could use some work on your chicken. We'll fix that. <laughs> the thing is, point part of my culture. I just want to keep preserving that and make sure that like uh, it continues on. Tradition just keeps going. That's what's most important to me. The yo-yo has a close tie to Ohio. The toy first showed up in the United States back in 1928, brought to California by a Philippine immigrant who eventually sold his business to a man named Donald Duncan. Donald then went on to establish Duncan Toys in Middlefield, Ohio during the Great Depression, and it's still headquartered there today. These days, yo-yoing is a competitive sport, and Steve Brown of Cleveland is one player whose skills go way beyond walk the dog. I didn't have any plans, I didn't have any goals, I didn't have any skills, I didn't have anything. I was just like another random kid wandering around, you know, waiting for life to happen to him. Brash, impulsive, and unemployed, at 18, Steve Brown found himself living on the streets of his home state of Florida. I was sleeping in my car, uh, which then that died. So <laughs> once the car died, I was just sleeping outside and I would couch surf or, you know, just kind of make do. Desperate for work, one day he wandered into a local novelty store that was looking for someone who could juggle and throw a yo-yo. 
Knowing nothing about either one, Steve took matters into his own hands. I stole a yo-yo from his store on my way out the door, and uh, I taught myself a couple of yo-yo tricks and uh, went back to his store. I was like, hey, look, I can do a couple of things. The job amounted to assembling magic tricks, tchotchkes, and yes, yo-yos. Illusionists and magicians who shopped in the store shared a few things with Steve like how to work a crowd and hand gestures that he began using in his yo-yo routines. Hanging out in his store, I was introduced to a lot of jugglers and people who did Diablos, devil sticks, magicians. And so I took inspiration from all of it. And as a result, I ended up being one of those few yo-yo players that had a distinctly recognizable, unique style because I didn't make up tricks based off of other yo-yo tricks. I made up tricks based off of other stuff that I had seen. At the same time Steve was sharpening his skills, yo-yoing was becoming a competitive sport, all thanks to a small innovation that replaced the wooden dowel in the middle of the yo-yo with a metal ball bearing that made it possible for yo-yos to spin for minutes at a time, allowing contestants to do elaborate tricks. There, were, uh, there was an invention of using a roller bearing as part of the axle into a ball into a yo-yo, and so with a roller bearing, and today we just refer to it as a ball bearing yo-yo. You can take basically instead of that yo-yo sleeping for say 10 seconds, when the yo-yo's at the bottom of the end string, spinning, we call that sleeping. So it took from a wooden yo-yo sleeping say 10, 15 seconds. Now with a roller bearing, a ball bearing yo-yo, you're sleeping minutes, and so you can imagine what that would do with. How, long, how many tricks you can do instead of those basic 10 tricks, now all of a sudden you expand into thousands of tricks. In 1996, Steve entered his first yo-yo competition. It was a small event that had a big impact on his life. For me, it was a creative outlet. This was the start of me finding a purpose for myself and then kind of expanding on it and like really creating a place for myself in the world. I still didn't see it so much as a career as I saw it as a way to sort of reclaim an identity for myself. You know, in a noisy, busy world, I, I wanted to have a space for myself. Steve's talent for throwing a yo-yo attracted the attention of Duncan Toys, the largest manufacturer of yo-yos in the world, located in Middlefield, Ohio, near Cleveland. And one day, they came calling. They actually approached me and offered me a job and I turned them down. And then I turned them down three more times after that. And the gentleman who was the sales manager at the time finally kind of wore me down. And I said, sure, no problem. Steve started off on our demonstration team and he was going across the country. We had a big, like Duncan minivan and he would go from retailer to retailer, retailer. And then um, we brought him up here to uh, continue not just demonstration, but to manage our team, to create additional players, uh, you know, additional team members, uh, as well as help us with the marketing and product development. Steve's brash behavior eventually got the better of him. He wasn't the corporate type, and after a few years, he left the company. It was tremendous work, uh, but a really uh, bad culture fit. Um, I'm not an office person. And I just didn't understand how to work in an office with people. I didn't understand how to work with a team. Um, you know, I was a, a performer who was always just kind of doing his own thing. So everything that I knew how to do was me, 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 but very well, but it was still just all about me. So I, I clashed really hard with a lot of people uh, very early on. And it took me a long time before I started to kind of get the hang of things. But realistically, by that point, I was so burned out uh, from trying so hard to fit into this style of work that I just wasn't good at at all. So I just had to, uh, I had to make some apologies, then I had to go. <laughs> Another cup of coffee and I drag myself to work. Today, Steve is still in the yo-yo business. He runs the online magazine Yo-Yo News, and he's overseeing as the 2016 World Yo-Yo Contest takes place in Cleveland, attracting contestants from all over the world. 
the world yo-yo competition and to you know a smaller extent like every yo-yo contest it, it really it's not just a platform for the tricks it's not just a platform for the kids it is it's an opportunity for people to find their tribe they might have met at a contest when they were 12 or 13 and then they see each other throughout the next five six seven years bringing those groups together bringing those friends together from all across the countries and and finding that common thing which is the yo-yo that's our show you can find all of our stories at wosu.org and be sure to check us out on facebook twitter and instagram we're taking you out today with a track called Factory Farm Blues by local singer-songwriter Happy Chichester. Thanks for watching. Be sure to join us back here next week on Broad and High. Factory Farm won't take me home. Look up my grave when you get home. When you get home, unbury my bones. And bring them back from a factory farm. Factory farm where once a home my mother's family raised and sold. What heaven gave of rain and loam, giving way to a factory farm. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com.